All right, let's get this show on the road. I want to talk about the Vancouver Canucks and their defensive core. Because the most recent article over here on Sportsnet, written by Emily Sather, talking about the remaining free agents of the UFA 2020 class in the NHL, goes over a few different ideas that I wanted to highlight here. So... Long story short, this is a long list that goes over several unsigned UFAs. Mike Hoffman is on here, Mikhail Granlund is on here. This is actually the same list we used in the Detroit Red Wings looking to add a free agent video a few days ago, so forgive me if you see any repetition there, but a few of the actual analyses, analyses, analysis, I am not sure what the plural version of analysis is. A few of the different write-ups done on some of these players ignite some ideas within me that I wanted to talk about here. And they all revolve around the right-handed defenseman core of the Canucks. If you take a look at the Vancouver Canucks on paper right now, who do they have on their right side? Firstly, you have the veteran, the experienced, the number one neck in the league. It is Tyler Myers. Secondly, you have Nate Schmidt, a guy whom the Vancouver Canucks recently traded for, and a guy who honestly is a pretty good NHL player. This guy is very skilled. And then, for the third spot on the right side, you have a little bit of a decision to make. When you used to have Chris Tanev and Troy Stetcher, this wasn't a problem. But now, you have an open spot with either a Jordy Ben coming in to fill it because he is a left-handed guy who can play on the right, or you call up your Brogan Rafferty, your AHL star who is absolutely dazzling in the Utica Comet system, and you say, okay, here you go, an NHL roster spot, let's go Brogan Rafferty. But what if you don't want to go that route? What if you want to say, okay, let's take a look at our decor, let's keep Jordy Ben on the left side, let's say that Brogan Rafferty is the seventh D. For all intents and purposes, we're saying that Jack Rathbone and Ollie Olevi don't exist in this simulation. Who do you put on the right side? Well, you go out there and you get yourselves another free agent D-man. And this is mentioned in the write-up here for, firstly, Travis Hamanick. According to Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman, Vancouver spoke with Travis Hamanick, but Nate Schmidt's arrival saw those talks break off. Friedman noted how Hamannick would want to stay in the West despite interest from some Eastern teams, including the Philadelphia Flyers. Interestingly, one team that could use a little more blue line depth in the form of a stay-at-home right side defenseman is Calgary, the team that he was with, but now he's not with anymore. In fact, he's still a free agent. At the time of this recording, at least, it's 12.56 a.m. in the morning, Tuesday, November 10th. But... The Vancouver Canucks were apparently in these talks, it's just Nate Schmidt was the guy who came in and made the Vancouver Canucks say, yeah, okay, sorry Travis, we're not going to talk to you anymore about this. But the Vancouver Canucks, if you go over to their cap-friendly page and take a look at what exactly their team makeup is at the moment, they have about, uh, yeah, zero dollars in cap space. Very great. They're over the cap by about $1.5 million at the moment, we'll see if Sending someone to the minors or sending Furlan on LTIR is going to be able to free up some money, but at the end of the day, they're still in a position where maybe they could add another defenseman, because another name that is mentioned here in this article is Sammy Votnin. Let's go over onto the eighth player on this list. Per Sportsnet's Elliot Friedman last month, Vancouver could still be searching for another D-man in addition to Nate Schmidt, and Votnin could be a fit there. So that's the idea we're going over here in this video. If your right side consists of Tyler Myers, you have Nate Schmidt, and then you have one of the Votnins or the Hamannicks, how could this team look on paper? What does it mean for Brogan Rafferty? What does it mean for Jordy Ben? And what does it mean for Ole Olevi or Jack Rathbone? Because your left side's already solidified. It's Hughes, it's Edler, and then the remainder of that Rathbone, Yolevi, Ben. If it's not Ben on the left side, then whatever. You kind of know where we're going with here. There's already kind of a logjam. And it would be easy to say, okay, trade Jordy Ben, but we know that the Vancouver Canucks just haven't really been successful in moving some of that money. And the fact that Adam Gaudet is a guy who has already confirmed that he gave up the number eight because it was free after Chris Tanev left, and he gave it to Jordy Ben because he really wanted eight. So just based off of that conversation as well, I think it's kind of easy to determine by proxy at least that Jordy Ben is not going anywhere. There is no real opportunity for the Vancouver Canucks to trade this guy. So let's just assume that he's going to stay. 
In a perfect world, would I want Jordy Ben to get traded? Yes, I would like to see a decor of Hughes, Edler, Yolevi all on the left side, and then on the right you have yourselves Brogan Rafferty, Tyler Myers, and Nate Schmidt. I'd love to see that. If not, add another right-handed defenseman and make Brogan Rafferty your seventh guy. That to me sounds great. But the fact is, there is a Jordy Ben that kind of throws a monkey wrench into that whole plan. So even though the Vancouver Canucks on paper could be seen as done, I think you still can make some improvements. If you want to go out there, you want to re-sign a guy like Travis Hamanick, who didn't end up suiting up for the Flames in the postseason, but who is a player who has been proven at the NHL level before. Hamanick, if you take a look, he's a 30-year-old right-handed defenseman, 6'2", 205 pounds. He, in the most recent season, posted up 12 points in 50 games, but is a half-decade removed from being a 33-point defenseman with the New York Islanders. He was 25 at the time. He was pretty good. He has been a consistent eh, 15, 20, a little bit less than that over the past few years kind of guy with the Calgary Flames. But injury issues aside, he is a fairly solid two-way defender who is capable of playing hockey at the NHL level. And then you have Sammy Votnin, a guy who also has been kind of plagued by the injury bug. It's unfortunate to see, of course, you don't like to see that out of your guys. He's 29 years old, 5'10", 185 pounds, so smaller than Hamanek. But Sammy Votnin has had 23 points in the most recent season of play. He had some pretty limited production in the postseason, three points in seven games. Obviously, that's not the be-all and end-all, especially in the playoffs. But Sammy Votnin on paper has had a better statistical profile when it comes to the numbers and the points than Hamanek. He also is a year younger, and he also was in a position where you honestly might be able to get him for a little bit cheaper. I'm not really too sure. I think you could probably get both of these guys for a pretty even amount because there's a flat cap, because it's been so long, and because, you know, nobody's going to be throwing out big bucks to these guys because they are in a position where all the teams have the bargaining power. And it's like, okay, you don't have several teams going after you anymore with big money. You're not Mike Hoffman. At the very least, you're not getting that huge one-year $6 million contract or whatever. So... Just take it or leave it. There are a few teams that will have the opportunity to actually shell out the money for these kinds of players if the Vancouver Canucks can move out money, either by doing the LTIR or a trade or sending someone out of Utica, then we'll see if that is somewhere in the plan. Because they still are over the cap. They still have money to move regardless on what happens with their signings or whatever. They need to do something regardless. So who knows if they have the potential to go overboard with the money they let up and then they use the extra money they free to go after a one-year cheap contract for any of these UFA D-men, whether it be Travis Hamannick, who adds size and pretty nice stability, or a Sammy Vatanen, who can produce points, and who can do so at a smaller stature onto their right side. So, yeah, that's a long rant about the Vancouver Canucks. Honestly, if Jordy Ben can just come back in here and play as if he was the Montreal Jordy Ben, then I'd be fine. He was okay in some moments. He had his pretty okay moments. There were some nights where he looked a little bit better than others. There were some nights where he looked kind of bad, but at the end of the day... The Jordy Ben that I watched with the Montreal Canadiens in 2018-19 was not the same Jordy Ben we saw with the Vancouver Canucks in 2019-20. Hopefully, he's able to embody the Fred Van Vliet energy and is able to use the new form dad powers he has to his advantage. Because if Jordy Ben is able to come back to the Montreal form, then I don't even really know if you need another defenseman in free agency. Because there was a more solidified, more sustainable, and more predictable game out of Jordy Ben with Montreal. It's just a lot of those qualities kind of fell out the door after he suited up for Vancouver. And I guess you could say the same thing about Tyler Myers, too. Myers was a pretty good point producer back with the Sabres and the Jets. But then he came to Vancouver and what happened? Nothing. So... Yeah, you know, hopefully we can get some good production out of these guys. And I know it's not even just about points and only the points, but at the end of the day, Tyler Myers has a $6 million AAV contract. And if it wasn't the Canucks that gave him that contract, it would have been some other team. So who knows if this guy is able to get back up to 30 point pace like he was with the Jets a few seasons ago then that'd be great. If you do the math on what Tyler Myers did with the Canucks in 2019-20, that's a 25-point pace, yeah? That's not the 36-31 point defender we thought we were getting, so who knows? I mean, he had 48 points back in his rookie year in 2009-2010. He hasn't matched that since, but, you know, there's potential there. If Jordy Ben and Myers can just get better, then we don't need to get another D-man, right? But, you know, if we're just taking a look at how they played in 2019-20 and we assume they performed to the exact same standard, 
then yeah, add another D-man. Or give Brogan Rafferty the chance, I don't know. Oh boy, we made it to 10 minutes? Holy, this has been a long commentary. I'm just rambling on at this point. Talk to me in the comments what you think about the Vancouver Canucks decor. I hope you enjoyed this edition of the Trolls and I9. And, bye. <laughs>